Welcome. My name is Deborah Fisher. I'm the Executive Director of Ablated Grass, and I'm really happy that everyone's here tonight. This is the, I think, the most interesting, exciting thing that we do. Ablated Grass is the first non funding nonprofit that only supports socially engaged art, um, and we are here to do a fellowship workshop, which means that you guys are all prospective applicants, right? Yes? Okay, awesome. Um, now, a blade of grass has a very, very specific stake in social practice. We support artists who are working collaboratively and co-creating in communities in a way that is ambitious and that directly enacts a social change, right? So we're thinking a lot about artists who are enacting rather than representing a social change. And we're going to go over that in a lot of detail tonight. So uh, our primary vehicle for this support is the Ablated Grass Fellowship for Socially Engaged Art, which is what everybody's here to talk about tonight. And we created the fellowship specifically because socially engaged art is really different than other types of art, OK? Uh, Socially engaged art has a tendency to create its own meaningful context out somewhere else rather than relying on an institutional context for its meaning. This is important. It has a tendency to be co-created. Therefore, it can be way more about its process than its product. And for these two reasons, socially engaged art is particularly resistant to being seen. Right? It's, it's difficult to see the work. It also has both aesthetic and social justice goals, and those goals need to be valued equally. And to do that, we have to use different tools and ideas. Uh, and the last thing is really, really important. Artists who are working ambitiously with social practice are actively creating, wielding, and engaging with institutional power rather than engaging in institutional critique. The fellowship is really designed to respond to these differences. And it does this by supporting the artist and the project directly in the context where it sits. We don't make an exhibition like the one that's here. Exhibitions are really great. It's just not what we do, right? And we don't present or produce public art projects. What we do is we give $20,000 of direct support to the artist to do the work directly in the community that they're working in. And we pair that set of resources with a set of listening tools and storytelling tools so that we can find out what's going on in the project and tell the story to other people, right? And here's how we do that. The first, do we have reports from the field on this? Awesome. Uh, we do journalism. Right, that relies on just asking really direct questions of the participants themselves. This is our reports from the field feature on our website. It's the, some of the best content we have, um, actually. It's very interesting. We do a 15 to 20 page ethnographic assessment, and we do a short documentary film about each project that is intended to really uh, expand the potential audiences for the work and make it visible. The fellowship is really designed to respond to these differences. And it does this by supporting the artist and the project directly in the context where it sits. We don't make an exhibition like the one that's here. Exhibitions are really great. It's just not what we do, right? And we don't present or produce public art projects. What we do is we give $20,000 of direct support to the artist to do the work directly in the community that they're working in. And we pair that set of resources with a set of listening tools and storytelling tools so that we can find out what's going on in the project and tell the story to other people, right? And here's how we do that. The first, do we have reports from the field on this? Awesome. Uh, we do journalism. Right, that relies on just asking really direct questions of the participants themselves. This is our reports from the field feature on our website. It's the, some of the best content we have, um, actually. It's very interesting. We do a 15 to 20 page ethnographic assessment, 
and we do a short documentary film about each project that is intended to really uh, expand the potential audiences for the work and make it visible. And here's a sneak preview, just to see what we're looking at. The culture of weeding, the personal habits of teaching yourself, is a very private affair that allowed for people to go through that own very personal process of discovery. One phenomenon that, that occurs with a lot of people that come here is that they almost automatically start telling you their life stories. Everybody can tell their biography by the books they were reading. Okay, good. My... Stop. Okay. So, you see, um, what we're doing is not just giving money to support a project, we're also presenters of socially engaged art. And the way that we do that is we find through this open call projects that are particularly great examples and that are particularly amenable to the types of storytelling that we're interested in. And then we tell those stories. We make a movie and we do a publication and we do the reports from the field and things like that. So what we want to do in this um, session, this fellowship workshop, is really think about, is really uh, very clearly discuss exactly what we're looking for, right, and what kinds of work we are going to uh, think are really, really good fits for the kind of presentation that we do, right? And then we're also going to talk about uh, another kind of uh, side effect of social practice, which is that in addition to being very resistant to being seen, it's also very resistant to being written about. <laughs> Because, uh, because it's happening with other people, and there are a lot of unknowns in any social practice project. And this is a really important part of the work. So it's a real pickle, actually, to write a 500-page description of, um, of a project where the whole idea is that you're sincerely making it with other people in a community that you're getting to know. So we're going to talk about two things tonight. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a really, really good example. Laura Chipley is here. Um, I'm going to introduce her in a second. Um, she has a great project called the Appalachian Mountain Top Patrol. It's a really good example. All of the fellowship projects that we have on our website from 2014 to 2015 are really great examples. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about exactly what our criteria are, because we want to be very transparent about that. We want to make sure that everybody who's applying is a really good fit. So Elizabeth Brady, our programs director, is going to kind of go over that. Elizabeth's back there. Is going to go over that a little bit and make sure that, you know, uh, we're being very clear about what exactly we're looking for. Because there are a lot of artists working in lots and lots of different kinds of ways. And the whole thing about art that's wonderful is that you can literally do whatever you want. As an arts organization, don't have that luxury. We are looking for something very specific. So, and then the very last thing that we're going to do is we're really going to focus on um, how people write successfully about social practice. Because one of the first things we figured out when we started doing a big open call for social practice projects is that it is damn close to impossible to clearly describe something that has both aesthetic and social change goals, that is uh, happening in, in an embedded way in a community, uh, that has unknowns for that reason, right? Um, you know, so, so for all of these reasons, social practice is uniquely difficult to write about. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at very specific examples. Uh, and we have a handout. Uh, Mary Mattingly, a, a 2015 fellow, and Saul Armendi, another 2015 fellow, who have great, really, really clear and very different letters of, uh, uh, for, the, for the initial round, right? So what we want to do is we, and these are not, you shouldn't copy these because, of course, art is unique, right? But we want to make sure that we're offering lots and lots of examples, right, to base your work on. And uh, we want to have a very good collaborative discussion about what makes these letters work so that you feel grounded in your own application process. Uh, one of the things that makes this last part work, this conversation among ourselves about these examples, is that we really focus a lot on the examples. Uh, if anybody has specific uh, questions about their own project, we are really into those two, but we, we feel them in a different way. So if anybody has specific questions about their project tonight, shoot Elizabeth an email. And uh, she is going to answer those questions with you personally. Um, one of the things that makes these sessions work really, really well is everybody is always really, really respectful of the fact that everybody needs to benefit from the questions, right? And so that's something that we're definitely going to focus on today. Uh, general questions that are good for everyone. Uh, and without further ado, Laura is going to come on up. Can we, can we tell her? Can we tell her who you are? Okay, so um, Laura is an interdisciplinary artist. She is based in Queens, New York, and she has a long history of working with communities on environmental issues. Her past projects include Deep Black Sea, an experimental documentary series that chronicles the aftermath of oil spills around the world, and the Newtown Creek Armada, which is an interactive boat pond created in the New York York Superfund site. Tonight, she will be presenting her current project, for which she is an Atlanta Brass Fellow of Socially Engaged Art, uh, which is called the Appalachian Mountaintop Patrol. This is a collaborative environmental watchdog multimedia education initiative that will train people in Boone County, West Virginia to document environmental contamination that results from coal and natural gas extraction in the Appalachian Mountains. Laura Chilton. Thanks so much for attending tonight, and thank you to the Brilliant Brass for inviting me to share my project with you. And a big thanks to them for all the support that they've given this project and the way that they support socially engaged art. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about my project, the Appalachian Mountaintop Patrol. I'm going to talk about the process and show some documentation, and also talk a little bit about how I came to do such a project. And so I came to socially engaged art by way of working in an art collective called the Urban Home Setting Project, which created fictional spaces in New York City using repurposed and found objects um, as a way to kind of foster positive in different neighborhoods. Um, and so what you see are some stills from one of our projects. This was actually our last project called Forest, where we collected discarded Christmas trees in the post-holiday season in New York City and used them to create makeshift forests around some of the most sort of ecologically devastated areas in Brooklyn. And this project brought us to do a lot of work around a place called the Newtown Creek. Um, which is the site of the second largest oil spill disaster in American history, but it's also right in the middle of New York City, separating Brooklyn and Queens. And so by doing this project, I started to get really interested in sort of looking at the aftermath of these disasters and also thinking about the people who live in close proximity to these disasters. And so this brought me to do the project that Deborah mentioned before, which is called Deep Black Sea which is an experimental series of documentaries that chronicle the aftermath of oil spills around the world. And so what you see at the top are some images from underwater, underneath the Newtown Creek, and then also below that, another segment of that project that was shot in the Gulf Coast um, in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill disaster. And that project also took me to the Amazonian region of Ecuador, where I collaborated with Petro-Ecuador workers and also the Campesino community and also the local Kofan tribe to 
documents what it was like to live in the aftermath of the oil exploration that was perpetrated by Chevron Texaco in the Amazon and all of sort of the leftover and the waste that happened there. And it was there that I started to experience what it was like to collaborate with stakeholders. I actually didn't go into that project thinking that it was going to be collaborative, but the people that I was working with who were taking me to these sites were so excited about the technology that we were, that we were using and they really wanted to take part in. And so I took this project, or this idea rather, of collaborating with stakeholders back to New York City and started working with two other artists, Sarah Nelson Wright and Nate Kensiger, on a project called the Newtown Creek Armada, which invited the public to come out and document the Newtown Creek using miniature remote control boats that had underwater cameras on them. Um, and so people came out to a public <coughs> site on the Newtown Creek. They were able to collectively document the pollution, sort of learn about the past and present, and sort of future, talk about the future of this creek. And also were able to look through video portals so they could see some of the even more kind of devastated areas um, that were off limits to the public. And so we were able to bring 800 people out to this site. Um, and it was very interesting to me, most of the people, or many I would say, the people who came out to the site were stakeholders. They lived in adjacent communities, um, and they came out and learned about this place, but many of them had no idea about that they were living in such close proximity to environmental disasters. And so this idea of collaborating with stakeholders really excited me sort of as I moved out of this project. And so I took an exploratory trip to Boone County, West Virginia, in 2012, and I'd spent a lot of time in West Virginia because my grandparents had a farm there, and I also had been working on a project um, with Pentecostal Christian serpent handlers in the southern part of the state. Um, and as I sort of went back and forth and worked on this project, I noticed that the mountainscape was disappearing. And so in 2012, I went down and I met up with a woman named Jamie Linville, uh, who was an ex-coal miner who lived in Van, West Virginia, completely surrounded by mountaintop removal and gas extraction uh, operations. And she took me on a seven hour ATV ride up into the mountains to actually go out on these sites. And as we went out on the site, she talked to me about the various ways that mountaintop removal and gas extraction were impacting her, the way it impacted her health, the way that it was impacting some of the social issues in the area, and of course, the environmental contamination. And she was very excited to share this with me. Um, and also to provide a counter narrative to what we get from the energy industry. And of course that narrative is that these operations may bring prosperity to the people who live um, in close proximity to them. So while the fossil fuel industry says this, in actuality there's a boom and bust nature to these type of operations. So it causes high unemployment, a lot of economic devastation, environmental devastation, and of course a public health crisis. Um, and part of this crisis is brought about by the fact that about 5.5 million pounds of explosives and diesel are detonated on a daily basis in this area to blow off the tops of these mountains. And in cleaning the coal, because of course this is clean coal that we don't want to burn all of these dirty byproducts from, they clean it in these areas. So they create these immense slurry pits um, of toxic wastewater that's genotoxic and neurotoxic. It creates um, high levels of birth defects. That's going to be out of here. Our sound went up in here. It creates high levels of birth defects, of miscarriages, of cardiovascular disease, of cancer, and brain tumor. And so it's really, it's a way that these towns are really being killed in many ways by sort of the public health disaster and the environmental disaster that's happening in these areas. And so that gave birth to this idea of the Appalachian Mountaintop Patrol. Um, as Deborah was saying, the Appalachian Mountaintop Patrol is an environmental watchdog and um, a multimedia education initiative that is collaborative. And it works with environmental activists in Boone County, Raleigh County, and Kanawha County, West Virginia, to use documentary filmmaking, aerial photography, uh, video surveillance, and also citizen science tools to tell the story of what it's like to live in close proximity to mountaintop removal. And so the participants in this project are seven central West Virginia residents. 
that hail from four different environmental organizations. And so those organizations are Coal River Mountain Watch, which um, largely deals with um, bringing about lawsuits against companies that are committing environmental organizations and also creating public awareness. There's Christians for the Mountains. They work with the evangelical community to bring about awareness and also frame this idea of opposing mountaintop removal as you know, being something that's of a spiritual nature and also of a moral nature. We're also working with the Kanawha Forest Coalition and also RAMPS, which is Radical Action for Mountains and People's Survival. And so those organizations tend to be a lot more radical. They're people who are, um, you know, who would get involved in sort of direct action campaigns, shutting down mines, chaining themselves to machinery, self machinery, blocking the entrance to some of these operations. Um, this project is also supported by the Public Laboratory for Open Technology and Science, which is a group of environmental scientists and designers and community organizers who collaboratively develop environmental testing kits that are both effective and also affordable. And so they provide a lot of support for the citizen science aspect of this project. There's also a larger network of collaborators through the organizations that I'm working with. Um, and these people are mine workers who uh, give interviews anonymously, also other people from the community who will talk about things on camera like uh, water contamination, and we also have a group of teenagers that we're training in video production. And the reason for working with environmental activists is really twofold. First of all, because it's to stand up against mountaintop removal in these areas, is, is, it's a lot of social fallout. It can actually be quite dangerous. Because mountaintop removal and coal extraction is really one of the only industries that pays a living wage in these areas, to stand up against that, there's intense sort of anger and venom that come from the people who are working in, uh, in this industry. And that can take the form of violent threats, actual violence attacking people at, uh, you know, attacking people at protests, slashing people's tires, cutting people's brake lines, people's family members getting fired, and so there's a lot of social blowback in standing up against uh, mountaintop removal in West Virginia. And so I wanted to work with people who were kind of already in the game. I didn't want to lead them into the game. I wanted to enable them to do what they were already doing. Um, and the other reason for working with environmental activists is sort of the hope that the things that we collaboratively produce and sort of the methods that we collaboratively come up with are then going to be able to align with their environmental initiatives into the future. So they're going to keep on using them after this project. Um, and so the first part of this process is really just meeting face to face with people several times, getting people's uh, trust, and also talking about how this project is going to work. Who's the audience? How are we going to do it? What are we going to learn? What tools are we going to use? Um, how can we align these things with the initiatives that are already in place? And also, really, what stories should we pursue? This is such an immensely complex issue, how mountaintop removal and gas extraction sort of impact people environmentally, socially, affecting their health, and also the economy. So we talked about our approaches to storytelling and sort of what were the important stories to distill. And some of those important stories were, of course, the intense water contamination that people have to deal with. Um, also, sort of the before and after, how things look before, and of course, being able to contrast how these mountains look afterwards. Um, we also wanted to talk about the fact that there's intense political corruption in West Virginia, and so the people whose job it is to monitor these sites don't do their job. There's really very little recourse. And so participants, we, we, I taught them sort of the theoretical side and also the technical side of documentary filmmaking. I and mean, these are people who are already pretty technically savvy in the first place. But we talked about how to use a video camera, how to use a microphone, how to do a good interview, how to tell a story visually. And these workshops took place both at Coal River Mountain Watch, which is a big facility in Naoma, West Virginia, and then out in the field. So we would go out into the field and we would sort of collaboratively come up with these methods for doing things like filming underwater contamination. Um, coal companies like to release chemicals into the waterway um, on Fridays and holidays when the DEP is not around to monitor it. So we talked about different ways to be able to document this and monitor this as well. So what you see is us sort of practicing here with the underwater video. 
Also, drones are a really important part of this project in being able to envision the massive scope of these operations because many of them are off limits. They're behind the tree line. You can't see them. Local people don't know what's going on. So we did a lot of drone training and practice to be able to go out and then get some images um, from these. Um, and so our best drone flyers are the ones who grew up with the Xbox controller <laughs> in their hand, right? Um, they're able, they got that sort of hand-eye coordination. It fits just like the helicopter level in Grand Theft Auto. So the drones also become an important way to kind of envision the natural beauty uh, of West Virginia, which is an important part of the story. So when we talk about storytelling in Appalachia, you know, storytelling is a tradition of Appalachian people, um, but also Appalachia is always flush with journalists and documentary filmmakers, and unfortunately, a lot of reality show producers. And so while people have done really beautiful, sensitive work talking about the impacts of things like mountaintop removal, there's also this other element who come in to sort of extract the story out of West Virginia. So here we see some examples MTV's Buck Wild, which is a bunch of quote unquote redneck teenagers acting crazy. We have the History Channel uh, television show, The Hatfield and McCoy's, of course, following the famous feud between the families. And then at the bottom, my least favorite Appalachian outlaw. So these people shoot at each other and fight each other so they can dig ginseng, which is a tradition in West Virginia to be able to dig medicinal plants, which can actually yield a lot of money. So it's really important in this project and something that we sort of came to together in discussing what we were going to do to try to combat some of these negative Appalachian stereotypes. And one of the collaborators said to me, like, well, do you think we're going to have music for this? And I said, yeah, I think that would be a good thing. He said, can we please not have banjo music? No banjo music in this project. Um, and of course, they still, I mean, many mountain top removal documentaries that are good use that banjo music. But of course, there's always sort of the throwback or the association with, with uh, deliverance, which can be a hard association to shame. So another thing, you know, in sort of telling that story of before and after, after to be able to document the biodiversity of these places. Um, the Southern Appalachian Mountains are one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Um, and they're being destroyed. But people need to know what we have in these places before they destroy them. Um, and so this was filmed actually by one of the participants, Robert Jarrell. He's an ex coal industry worker, as almost all of the people that I'm working with are. Um, and he knows quite a bit about the flora and fauna of West Virginia. And so he's really jumped to the task of going out and filming all the different variety of species that you see, all the different types of mushrooms. Um, and it's been a really exciting thing to see this talent sort of emerge. He's always wanted to be a photographer or a cinematographer. Um, here he's filming some fish underneath the water. So again, it becomes really important in telling before and after. Here we see a pretty close call with our drone, which is always, um, it's always a little bit of a nerve-wracking experience because the GPS signals are not constant, and so you sometimes can't see where you're going or what you're doing. So another storyline that's really important to talk about in sort of this realm of before, like what this area is before, it um, is subjected to mountaintop removal, is the culture of self-reliance in Appalachia. Appalachian people have always been food insecure because of the coal industry, um, but people have also learned to sort of make a living from the mountains, right? Hunting and fishing, but also digging medicinal herbs, um, which they can sell for quite a lot of money. What has changed quite a bit from you know, one generation to another is that the generation that's coming of age now is trespassing by doing these things. Because corporations own most of the mountains that are around, as one of the collaborators said, just to walk out of your house, you're trespassing. Trespassing can have um, some pretty bad impacts for people, particularly if you're a quote unquote tree hugger, which is of course how a lot of the people that I'm working with are known in the region. Um, for example, the young man you're about to see, Junior Walk, who has become an environmental activist at great personal risk, was thrown out of his house after quitting his coal industry job to speak out against mountaintop removal, um, has had the brake lines on his truck cut, had wanted signs put up um, around the different haulers and neighborhoods, uh, I guess, because people are looking for him. 
he uh, actually was involved in a lawsuit against Alpha Energy, which was Nazi energy before. Um, they took him to court for trespassing for one of his environmental actions, and he out now owes them $500,000 for this. Um, and as he said, I was born in poverty, and I'll die in poverty, and they'll never get my money, but that means he can never have a bank account or sort of function in the way um, that he might want to function in a financial sense. So it's important to capture these stories, stories and sort of preserve this idea of you know, how people are living off the mountains and how when these mountains disappear, that opportunity uh, is also gone. So here's just a little clip from Junior. What we've got right here is a nice little three-prong ginseng plant. Uh, we are on Montcole Mountain in Raleigh County, West Virginia, and this is the, uh, the 3rd of September. Right, Danny? Yeah. Yeah, this is the 3rd of September, and so we're going to dig this little buddy, and uh, hopefully he's got a real nice-looking root on him. You can see the uh, he's got one little berry left. Oh, it just fell off. But, uh, yeah, so that berry will uh, create a new ginseng plant so that future generations can enjoy uh, harvesting wild ginseng here in the Coal River Valley. So one of the other important things that we want to capture is sort of what everyday life is like in Appalachia. A lot of the documentaries that have been made, while they're wonderful documentaries, sort of fail to show what people are really like. And by that I mean that they're so sort of highly topical that you don't get sort of a glimpse of everyday life. You don't really get a sense of who people are. And so the teenagers involved in this project um, have sort of taken on that role of trying to document everyday life. So these teenagers have been working with RAMPS, Radical Actions for Mountains and People's Survival. They had been working on a wood chopping initiative that was meant to kind of get them off the street and show them skills to make money. But after their chainsaw was stolen, we came up with the idea that maybe they should be taught video production. And so we've been teaching them video production and they take the cameras out and they film. They think that the term or the name Appalachian Mountain Control is way too militant for their parents and that their parents won't let them participate if they call themselves also the Appalachian Mountain Top Patrol. So they've sort of formed a subgroup and it's called the Coalition of Whitesville Youth. And so they're now making a YouTube page and filming everyday life in West Virginia, but then also contributing that footage to our project. So here's just a little bit, this is early on in the video production, but this is um, some of the local kids taking an ATV to the scrapyard to sell it. What do you think of this ride, Ryan? I don't know, but I'm gonna settle this. It ain't gonna slide into y'all, is it? No. It's definitely not gonna slide into me now. <laughs> He's on it. My, 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 my. From my, 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 we all love to get cash in the town of Whitesville, don't we, Dave? That's right. We're straight up hustlers in this town. Hell the yeah. Fucking love video recording. Oh, this is great, Dave. I feel so liberated. So as you said, he feels so liberated by the video recording. Um, so another important part of this project is, of course, to record the aftermath of mountaintop removal. Removal and drone photography has become really important in this process because, as I said before, a lot of these operations are completely off limits to people. All the land is owned by corporations. People can't get out to see what's trickling down into their communities. This is some drone footage of the Marsh Fork Elementary. This is actually one of the sort of few wins that local people have had against the energy industry. Because this elementary school, as you can see, is in such close proximity to a coal processing plant, the kids were getting sick. They were suffering from everything from asthma to leukemia because of the proximity of their school to this plant. So again, it becomes important to visualize the proximity of these operations to where people live and they go to school. One of the other things that the drone photography can do is also show violations. And so you can see for a second in here, you can see down at the bottom we have a bunch of pools of liquid. That's actually MCHM. That's a coal cleaning um, compound. It's actually what spilled into the Elk River two years ago and caused a huge water, huge water crisis in West Virginia. And then actually from that footage you can see it leaking into the local waterway. So this is some drone footage we took of the 
brushy pork whole slurry impoundment. This is seven billion gallons of toxic wastewater that's held back by the largest earthen dam in the Western Hemisphere. So it's larger than the Hoover Dam. What's below all of this are a bunch of towns. So it's an earthen dam between 700 um, billion, seven billion gallons of toxic wastewater in people's homes. These dams have been compromised in the past to terrible effects, essentially creating a tsunami of toxic wastewater that comes down and uh, takes out entire towns. People are really concerned about this, uh, this operation right here, partially because of the bad history of slurry impoundment, partially because this slurry actually leaks down into the aquifer. It's actually not contained in this pool. Leaking down to the, so the aquifer means that it contaminates all the well water in the area. Because people can't drink their well water because it's filled with heavy metals, the city has to bring water out um, to these haulers, into these very isolated areas, which of course overtaxes the system in a way that it can never properly clean, clean the water. So you can drink your well water and drink heavy metals, or you can drink the city water and get a parasite. So it's very sort of difficult, and again becomes a real sort of complication in getting clean water. And so again, we shoot this footage to allow people to visualize the actual scope. And from having seen this compound myself, even the drone footage can't fully kind of capture what the scope is of this operation. So right here we have KD2, which is right next to the Kanawha um, State Forest. And so this operation was actually shut down for violations, but by flying a drone over this operation, we were actually able to see that they were still extracting coal from part of the site in violation. So even when they get quote unquote shut down and taken over by the DEP, we still see that the extraction process goes on. So this becomes important for organizations like the Kanawha Forest Coalition to be able to use this to prosecute. And so here's some images of them going out and also taking environmental samples. In addition to using the drone footage, we also use water quality sensors and video cameras to film some of the pollution. So here we see some toxic water runoff. And what people do is they go out and they use the water quality monitors to be able to measure the pH level. And what we're going to see here is a pH level that's highly, highly acidic. So as this flows down into the local waterways, um, it causes a lot of damage to the environment and also to people. So I've also been working with the Kanawha Forest Coalition to use some other technology in sort of being able to monitor some of these sites. So what you see there at the top is very familiar technology in West Virginia. This is called a trail cam. You see it's camouflage. It looks kind of like bark right there. It's actually um, used for hunting. So it's motion, it's got a motion sensor. When a deer walks by, it'll shoot some video so you know where the deer are walking around. We're actually working with Public Lab to hack this camera to make it respond to sound rather than motion so that when the alarm goes off before one of the big explosions on the site, it'll be able to shoot some video and capture the explosion happening on the site. Below, we see the Mobius infrared camera. This is something also developed by Public Lab and supported in this project by Public Lab. This becomes just another way to sort of use censored journalism to envision the damage that's being done in these communities. So they measure plant photosynthesis, and so you're able to find a different way to see these things. We're also using sensors to address some of the public health concerns. So here's the dust we know, also developed by Public Lab, and you can see down below and um, we're building our first prot prototype of the dust we know, actually with help from the NYU Polytechnic Robotics Lab. And so these, uh, these sensors measure particulate matter because all of the dust coming down from these explosions is making people really sick. And so we're working to install this. We're going to do the first one at the headquarters of Pole River Mountain March to start using that as a method for storytelling. So in terms of the goals and the output for this project, um, it's a complex project because it's a really complex issue. So some of the outputs will be this, is that we will create a series of web videos because we do want to raise general awareness. And some of these videos are also going to be targeted at specific audiences. And so through Cold River Month and Watch, we'll be able to target the specific audience of lawmakers. Through Christians for the Mountains, we'll be looking to target the specific audience of the evangelical community. But one thing that's very important in addition to raising general awareness, is raising the local awareness. 
So the videos are, are also going to be shown at local screenings and at local community meetings as a method for rallying opposition against new permits so that when people know that a new permit is now on the table for a mountaintop removal operation, they can see what the mountain looks like before, they can understand the biodiversity, we can help them visualize how that plays into their Appalachian culture and how they support themselves, and then they're able to see what it looks like after. And in terms of our goals, of course, we want to really raise that local awareness. We don't want to just extract the story and kind of send it off to California, because where, while it's important for everybody to know, it's most important for the local people to know. Um, and we're also looking to really use these methods into the future as they're sort of taken up and owned by the local organizations. So I think I've gone over my time, but thank you. <laughs> Is 
becomes a critical moment in trust, right? That I'm showing up and I'm giving your organization this equipment. It's not cheap equipment, and I already believe in you. That I know that you're going to be able to, you know, use this in a way that's going to be beneficial and that's going to be able to further um, what your initiatives are. And so I felt like that was a kind of a critical moment in establishing the trust as well. But it is very complex, and it also, I think, is important in projects like this to not, you know, I come from the background of documentary filmmaking, and so as I go and I give these workshops, it almost seems like it's very instructive in a sense, that I'm telling them how to shoot video, and giving them ideas about visual storytelling, and so you have to be careful about that, and always kind of bring it back to what are our collective ideas. And so, I mean, I had thought out a lot of this project before it started, what the project's name was, how it was going to go, and I found myself in the process of planning meetings, having to go back and really say, like, is, is the title Appalachian Mountain Cup Patrol something that you want to be called? I don't want to inflict this on you. And then also just thinking about collectively um, coming up with these stories so they know that the project is nothing without them or without me, that we all have our role. And I would say also for the citizen science, um, it's been an interesting and good uh, experience because a lot of this, uh, because my background is in documentary filmmaking and not citizen science, we've been learning a lot of these tools together. We learned how to fly the drone together as well. And so that becomes sort of a nice way to always bring it back to sort of the framework of a collaboration rather than it being you know, a workshop where I'm just teaching and then giving them homework, for instance. I have a question about the unpredictability of an um, ambitious project. How did you deal with writing this up when a lot of the best stuff you couldn't necessarily predict how it would unfold? I mean, I, I think that a lot of these projects you just have to throw caution to the wind. I, I had kind of a, you know, a process where I, I came up with this idea and I pitched it to a blade of grass and they were interested and then I sort of had to go back and say, you know, is this idea even really feasible? Now there's a possibility I can do it. I have to go back. And that became the process of starting to talk to the environmental organizations. And at first, I did not necessarily get positive feedback. People would tell me things like, oh, they're just going to shoot down your drone. And, and really sort of underscored also like the violence and the violent threats and all of the sort of social turmoil that goes along with this. And so as I sort of kept at it and as I made more and more contacts, I actually found um, that maybe that wasn't always the case. But I did have some moments of wondering if I was just doing something crazy and terrible and if it wasn't going to work. And I feel like any project like this, because it's unpredictable, is like that. Laura, can you speak a little bit to the question about writing about it specifically? Mm -hmm. Like about going like, because uh, you don't know what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Because you were really compelling. LOI. Yeah, I mean, it was really, Literally it was different. sort of about, I thought about it in terms of, of, of what could happen, right? And thinking about that I had, in before writing the letter of interest, kind of done the legwork to bring together some of the interested parties um, and sort of, sort of writing about sort of what could happen with those yeah. interested parties. Um, um, and coming up with a plan, Howard. I feel like the letter of interest that I wrote may be, may be one of the strong parts that I had it pretty A lot about the, um, the social impact, um, like raising awareness, like documentation. Uh, can you elaborate on the aesthetic goals? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I feel like for so we all collectively film, and what sort of the way that breaks down is that the collaborator, my collaborators in West Virginia, follow these really specific storylines, like I talked about before, which are self reliance and beauty of nature. And you know, the contamination and sort of my aspect of filming is filming the documentation and also just working as a facilitator who has experience as a documentary filmmaker. In terms of the aesthetics, really, and sort of being able to capture the vast expanses and also these little tiny <coughs> details of contamination and then frame it in a narrative sense of all of sort of like the reverberations that happen because of this social reverberations and also the public health um, issues is one of sort of the aesthetic approaches. Um, and also I'd say one of the other um, things that deals with the aesthetics that I'm excited about is to be able to see this area through the eyes of the people who live there.
there rather than just through the eyes of the people who have come from the outside to sort of document and take the story away. So I find that really compelling to sort of see these images of, as the local people sort of envision the beauty of nature and also as they're sort of reacting to the environmental destruction. Um, <coughs> one of the things that's really crucial about um, that these workshops is that we want to set a precedent with everyone who's applying that we're entering into a relationship with you, right? This is something that is a long-term thing. We're going to be together for a year. This isn't dating. This is the real thing, you know? Um, and what we want to do is make sure that, you know, before we move in, that we're all going to get along. Which basically means, it's a metaphor for everything being a really good fit. Your needs and our needs, right? Every organization has a mission. And just because you have an excellent, excellent, fantastic project doesn't mean it's necessarily a great fit for our mission. And so that question of fit is something that we really look at a lot with these applications. I should say that in terms of the way that we look at the applications and the way the selection committees look at the applications, uh, it's about 50% how fabulous you and your project are, and about 50% how good a fit is it for a blade of grass and for the idea of being a part of a cohort, okay? And so one of the key things to keep in mind when you're looking at this material, and when you're looking at your project and kind of comparing the two, is to make sure that your work is an excellent, excellent fit before you go through what we know is a little bit exhausting and a little bit work intensive process with client, right? We try to make it as easy as we can. It's a, it's a one page letter of interest and a link to a website. That's it, right? And your CV, which hopefully you have set more or less as it is. Um, but it's still work, you know? And we don't want you to go through that work if it's not a good fit. Because we love you, we love artists, we want you to be happy. We don't want you to bang your head against the wall, right? Um, that doesn't mean you're not a part of our community. It doesn't mean we're not part of yours. It just might mean that, you know, maybe next year's project is a better fit than this one, right? So just keep that in mind as we're kind of moving through this. Um, and then the lovely Joel to pass will hopefully uh, click on our selection criteria so that we can take a look. Um, and I want to take actually start maybe at what we fund and what we don't fund. Projects that feature artists in leadership roles, we believe on all of you. Um, Dialogue-based projects that emphasize sustainable partnerships with communities. And corollary to that is seeing the community as an equal partner. Co-creation, right? That's what Laura was talking about. You know, if I just come in and say I'm going to do my thing, that's not co-creation, right? It's, it's that dialogue, it's that back and forth that makes this work work. Um, we value this speaks to one of your questions. Um, we value process over product, and we understand that relationship building and problem solving are key goals. You're going to write a proposal that's going to be clear as a bell and elegant prose and wonderful, and you're going to start your project and things are going to start to change just about right away, right? Because that's how this work functions. We get that. We're an organization that focuses on that. Does that mean you shouldn't have a plan of action? Of course not. We need to see that you've thought through your, your, you know, your project, and we need to see that you have a plan in mind. However, we do understand that things evolve. When they do, just come to us and say, hey, you know what, my project is evolving. This is how it's changing, right? We understand that that happens. Um, we provide funding with minimal restriction. Budget line items may include things like living expenses, childcare. Um, and then we also, we fund artists working nationwide. Everyone needs to, though, this is a, uh, one of the criteria for eligibility. You've got to either be a, a U.S. citizen or somebody who, who has legal status for working in the U.S. And that's not our role, it's the IRS's. Okay, it's just, it's about our legal status. So it's not a discriminatory thing. It's just the, the system we're functioning in. Uh, what we don't fund, this is, this is another key thing, um, projects in which the focus is on producing an exhibition, a theater production, or objects for display. When we're focusing on the engagement piece, we don't fund shows. There are lots of other grants that do, right? That's why we don't. Okay? We're, we're targeting a different area. 
Uh, residencies or studio practice, except as they directly relate to achieving outcomes of a community-based project, uh, projects that lack co-creative outcomes, uh, or 501c3s, okay? If you are a 501c3 yourself or you and your collaborators, you're not eligible, okay? Um, and again, that's not because we hate nonprofits. <laughs> it's because they have other means of applying for grants that individual artists don't have, right? And so what we're trying to do is tar be really targeted and fill a gap. Um, so let's go to the selection criteria. Okay, um, so the way that we choose, okay, so you understand our process, we uh, invite you to apply with a letter of interest, a one-pager. That letter of interest is reviewed by a committee, okay? So every letter of interest gets read by a committee that usually is made up of specific categories of people, to the best of our ability to do that. A community organizer, an artist who's always a fellow from the previous year, or sometimes from not the previous year, maybe in the future, but so far it has been. Um, an arts administrator, generally a curator or an administrator of an organization that engages communities. Um, and who oh, lovely never question. Um, and who am I? Oh, and an educator. Yeah. So those. So the idea is that all the different voices who might be sort of stakeholders in your project maybe have a voice on the committee. That's what we're shooting for, right? Um, so there's that initial screening, and then around 50 projects, give or take, um, are selected for a final application round. And that's where you write your big application, where it's like 2,000 words instead of 500, okay? Um, what we look at, uh, this, is, this is the exact thing that our committee sees. Can we mention that we have a non-artist on every committee so that every letter has, like, has to kind of like, just mention that a few times? That's a, that's yeah. a really good point of clarification. The community organizer is a non-artist community organizer. This is someone with zero art background. So your, your proposals have to be written so that, I, I call it the mom test, would my mom get it, right? You know, in other words, would a person with basic intelligence and the ability to read understand what the heck you're talking about? Because you really need to be that clear. And also, depending on the community you're working with, you may need to be that clear as well, right? Um, but that's, um, that's definitely something to keep in mind. It's so easy to kind of get wrapped up in your own prose, I think. I do this a lot in my own writing, and I'm not even an artist. Um, so focus on, on that external audience, right? Somebody outside yourself, somebody outside the art world. Try to get a couple of friends to read it if they have the patience for it, or even to read a paragraph of it, just to see if it's making sense to somebody outside of you know, our little world. Um, that's pretty important. Um, so, artistic excellence. Does the, the artist have a strong track record? We don't care if you showed at MoMA, okay? That's not what we mean. What we mean is, have you been engaged with this kind of work? Do you have a commitment to it? If you haven't been working in this way for a long time, what kind of brought you to this place, right? What's, what's, what, um, what is it? that makes you a good candidate for this position. And we accept proposals all the way across the range, and both of the classes of fellows we've had so far have had emerging artists and senior artists, okay? And I'm not talking about age, I'm talking about experience, right? So just because you're emerging doesn't mean that you won't make it. Um, it's about the quality of the project. Is the project ambitious? Does it look like it's trying to do something, you know, that stretches the envelope a little bit, right? Uh, is it aesthetically compelling? If somebody asks, what is it, art, you know, what is art about it, do you have an answer for that question? Not that we're going to ask that, but what we, we do look at the aesthetics in balance with the social change and the, these other criteria, right? Uh, 
can it act as a leading example in the field of socially engaged art? This is where we start to get to that fit idea again. For us as an organization, we're a young organization, and we're in the business of trying to make the world a better place for you guys, which means that we need tools to accrue resources to this kind of work. We want to give out 50 fellowships, right? And so in order to do that, we need excellent examples to say, look at these brilliant, wonderful people who have done these incredible projects, right? Um, and we use the ethnographic style evaluations to help tell that story. We use the videos, like we saw Pablo's video, to help tell that story. But you need some good raw material, right? And so we're looking at things that are that are really um, that are really interesting, you know, leading examples. That can mean a lot of things, right? Um, and we're comfortable with the vagueness of that, but that's what we're looking for. Um, the project's capacity to enact social change. This is part of our mission. Okay, so again, that sort of you know socially engaged versus social practice. The reason we use socially engaged art as the name of this work is because we're talking about that social change component, which is in our mission statement. Um, does it approach a specific issue in a new way or offer an opportunity for innovation? A lot of times what you guys are doing is something that is a completely new approach to an angel problem, right? Uh, and we'd love to see that, and it's really exciting. Um, does it enact as opposed to represent social change? So let me explain what we mean by that. So something that represents social change might be a political artwork that hangs on the wall of a gallery. Does that mean we don't like political art? Of course it doesn't mean that. What it means is that what we fund is art that's really engaged actively in change. Representing it and showing that to the public can be important too, but there are venues for that, there are institutions for that. Is giving voice enacting or representing social change? Giving voice is representing social change unless that voice is used to a specific end. Right. If you're addressing policymakers with your voices, if you're, um, if you're, uh, I don't know. That's that's the one that comes to mind. Yeah, that comes to mind. Yeah. The way it gets um, that. But but simply saying, you know, here's a platform isn't really quite enough. Um, is the project aesthetically or formally innovative? We like interesting art. You know. Um, does that mean that if you're using a, a method that's been used before that your project won't be considered? Of course not. If it's a really sound project, we still want to see your proposal. Right? Uh, but we do consider this as, as one of the criteria. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions afterward, okay? So just bear with me. I'm just trying to kind of explain what you've probably already read. The project's viability in everyday life. Does it attract the interest of non-artist stakeholders? This is um, what I unkindly say to myself all the time when I'm questioning my own work. I say, why should I care? Does it answer the why should I care question for Right? Are they interested in what you're doing? Are they interested in working with you? It's a meaningfully engaged community or communities. In other words, are you digging in there and interacting with people, right? Uh, is it legitimately helpful? Some things are really well-meaning, but they're not really as helpful as you think they're going to be, right? Um, and that's about asking questions and engaging with people and finding out what their needs are. Um, is the language externally focused? That's the, the bomb test question. Right? Um, will people who are not artists get it? Um, is it meaningful in the absence of a contemporary art context or an initiated audience? It can be meaningful in different ways. It can be meaningful to people as something besides art. Each stakeholder is going to take something different away from the project, probably. Right? But are they pulling something out of it that's doing something? Um, and is it feasible? You'd be surprised at sort of the, the grand, um, the grand sweep for that can show up in 500 words, but it's not always completely believable. And that goes back to um, that question of um, 
your track record too. If you've done a project like this before, and you can say, I know this sounds crazy, but look at this other crazy thing I did. Then it's a little more believable that it's feasible. And if you have it, that's okay, but just tell us how you're gonna do it, right? Give us a roadmap to follow. Give us a few nuts and bolts. Give us an indication of how it's gonna happen so we can believe you, right? And it's not just us, because we have a lot of faith. But the people on the committee aren't internal to this practice always. They're not always, you know, people who know a blade of grass tremendously, tremendously well. Some of them are from all over the country. Um, and so keep that in mind. And then fit with resources. Um, so are you working independently? You're not a 501c3. The second one is a big one, actually. Will you or your project particularly benefit from a supportive cohort of other artists working on similar problems. You become part of a cohort in this fellowship program. We have meetings periodically that are professional development opportunities, but they're also, I think more to the point, ways of sharing your work and sharing techniques and interests with one another. And these meetings have been very productive and important to the artists that we've worked with so far. But we need people who are interested in working with others in that way, with other artists, not just your communities. And it's only a couple of meetings a year. There's an orientation and two additional meetings. Okay. Uh, I think that's what we're doing. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, so it's three times. It's not, but they are all day. The orientation is a two-day orientation, and then the other two meetings are one day each. Okay. So if that's something that doesn't fit with your, your working method, again, that's a fit thing. Right? It's fine that you don't want to work that way, but then it's not a good fit with us. Um, and I think I don't need to beat the other ones. I think those are pretty clear. Um, top reasons projects weren't selected. Okay? You guys can read through these on your own. I don't need to belabor this. Um, you can certainly ask me questions if you um, have them. One though that I particularly, or a couple that I want to particularly point out, one is um, the idea that uh, the relationship to the community is poorly defined or overly prescriptive. What we mean by overly prescriptive is the artist swoops in, has an idea, and says, come make my art with me, rather than engaging with the community saying, what are you guys interested, let's make something together, right? Is a captive audience an, an example like uh, of an overly prescriptive relationship? Mm -hmm. I would say that completely depends. Yes, but like say like you're working with somebody like a uh, like population of school or a prison, would you would you probably go the extra mile and kind of describe why people want to participate instead of the fact that they just kind of have to? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like and and also how you're listening to them because they're in a disempowered position. Right. Yeah, like how, what's, what's their possibility for agency in that context? Yeah. Does that make sense? I speak mm -hmm. too much carrier to carry your speak. Okay. Um, call me on that if I do that. Sometimes I slip. Um, this is another one. The project completed access to contemporary art and social change. Saying, I'm going to show art in a community where they don't have contemporary art space. That's, that's not what we find either. It's a great thing to do. It's just not what we find. Um, and then the project has an impact exclusive to or primarily in the service of the initiated contemporary art dialogue. If your community and your intended audience is the folks in this room where people like us, it's not going to be a good fit. We were focused on things that are external to the art world, or that, that where that, that space between the art world and the real world intersects. Okay. Um, so I would be delighted to take any questions you have about this. Uh, thank you very much for offering this uh, to all of us here. They're interested in applying. I was checking out uh, Pablo Guerra's work, and it says that his is a nonprofit bookstore. No. no. Yeah. It's a uh, question. Right. It's, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a 501c3. Okay. So it's a bookstore that doesn't make any money on purpose. Oh. <laughs> it's not. It's not a legal organization. 
Okay, so that, yeah, I was just seeking some yeah, clarity. Yeah, totally understand that, yeah. So the choice of words is, is it's, so it's a nonprofit, but it's not a 501 thing. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's not like a nonprofit, you know, in quotation marks. It just, okay. It's just not intended to actually <laughs> it doesn't pay for itself whenever money yeah, comes to the door, he donates to other organizations. Yeah. But can you clarify that a little bit and talk about the fact that we, we're not necessarily just looking for 501c3 status? That's true. Yeah. We, we're also looking for <coughs> things that are going in the direction of 501c3 status. And so if you have fiscal sponsorship and you're thinking not in terms of a project, if you have just fiscal sponsorship for your individual project, that's okay. But if you have fiscal sponsorship because you're trying to put together a board and become an org, and if you're calling yourself an executive director, or if you have a big advisory committee, yeah. you know, like those kinds of things, if you're moving towards an organization instead of a project, we fund projects. Yeah, if you look like an org and smell like an org, even if you don't have legal status, you count as an org in our book. Right. How do international can these projects as international as you like, as long as the person who is applying, um, who may be an individual or the representative of a collective, um, is uh, legally able to work in the United States. The aftermath of the project, what would you guys consider to be a successful project? Uh, the question is, what is success? Um, we work with each of the artists to um, come up with the definition of success at the outset of the project. Um, and so we believe that you guys should be defining your own success um, and setting your own goals. And we work with you and with um, the evaluator. By the way, the evaluation isn't a judgmental evaluation, it's a developmental evaluation, okay? And so it's not like, ha ha ha, you didn't do what you said you were gonna do. It's, it, it's this is what I'm hearing, this is what you say you're doing, they don't quite match up, how can we, how can we work through that, right? Um, and the person who does that, um, mostly for us is um, Jan Cohen Cruz, who has a million years of experience doing this, and she's brilliant, and I've never heard an artist not love her, um, who's worked with her. But yeah, so artists set their own definitions of success, which they share with us, and we talk together um, about ways that we can help amplify that, um, because one of the things that we really like to do as an organization is put you in touch with people, um, you know, we, if we know people who can help you out, or if you have, you know, oddball questions, it's like, wow, I need legal advice about X. It's like, well, let's see if there's anybody on our board who knows somebody who can help you out, right? And so we try to kind of work with you around, like, the edges to, to make that success tangible. Does that help? Can I, can I add to that just a little bit? Because one of the things that we're finding is that that definition of success while it can change, and it does evolve for almost every artist we work with throughout the course of the year, we're finding that because the projects themselves are in, they're out in the world, and so they're not in our context, and we are going and representing them to other people and things like that. So the, so the more clarity, we're finding that the more clarity we can get around this notion of what success is to you, then the more successful we are in helping you with your project. Yeah, the easier it is for us to be really effective on your behalf. The other thing is yeah. because there's no like thing that we can all look at together, you know? Um, I'm wondering if, so basically I straddle the intersection between artistry and arts education. I've been doing so for about 20 years. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit towards the, uh, so maybe the, the past ability of education being a major part of yeah. the process for sure. the projects. Yeah, this is, this is an easy one. <laughs> um, so things that are strictly arts ed, where the artist doesn't consider it a central part of their practice, something they wouldn't put their name on as their project, doesn't really work. But if it's something that's central to your practice and you're like, you know, as, you know, whatever your name is, you know, as John Smith, as, you know, Betsy Jones, whatever your project is, if you would put that on your website and say, I did this, right, and this is part of my art practice, doesn't mean you're taking credit for everything, right? And we're not saying, like, don't give your community members credit, um, your collaborators, your partners, your stakeholders. Um, but it does kind of have to be partly about you because it's 
about artists and leadership roles too. Um, we have a stake in amplifying the voices of artists as their own administrators. Um, not that curators have no role, but institutions do things to art that distort it sometimes. And we want the artist to have the chance to not have their work distorted in that way, right? And so by putting the artist in this place, that's what we're trying to do. And so because we have that perspective, we really shoot for things where it is really a central part of their practice. Although there's a lot of education involved. I mean, Laura talked about you know workshops, and you can see Plugin Studio, one of our current fellows, um, they did a project that is heavily invested in arts education. And the previous year, Sex Ed, um, another collective, did the same thing. Okay, so those are two really great examples, um, and I know you know Sex Ed, um, of people who have, have done just that. And so if you have a question about whether, you know, where your work falls on that spectrum, please feel free to shoot me an email. With the grant that's given to artists, is it given in disbursements, or is it given 20,000? Disbursements. So, okay, so how does that work? Is it based upon their achievements and the process, no. or? No, it, um, it's uh, 10, and then eight, and then two. Um, and, you get the second payment after you write your interim report, which isn't, look at all the things I did that I said I was gonna do in my proposal. It's, this is what's up, what I'm up to now, right? It's not a big, huge thing. It's, it's a developmental tool, again, not a, a judgmental tool. Um, and um, the, the reason that there's the two at the end is because we need the final report for IRS purposes. <laughs> Um, but again, we, we see that final report as a way for us to understand what you feel you got out of it. So it's really helpful to us as an organization so we can keep helping artists better, so we can keep improving our work. Um, but so that that 2000 was sort of pulled at the end of the final report. Sorry. Um, so at this point, what I would love to do is if you have further questions, please don't hesitate. Shoot your questions to info at abladedgrasp.org, okay? Um, and we're going to divide the group in half. And how many people do we have here? I wonder. Three, eight, eight, ten, eighteen, eight. So we have approximately thirty. So we'll go like group, like a group of fifteen and a group of fifteen. Um, we can probably almost kind of divide up the middle, but I might have to have a few of you from this side go to this side. Okay, so make friends across the aisle. <laughs> Um, and there are going to be some handouts, and then Deb and I are going to um, facilitate a discussion in each group about um, kind of how to write a good application for us, you know. Um, and hopefully this is something that will be useful to you beyond this room and beyond Ablative Graphs. That's our ambition, is to do something that's also a service to you all. Um, so, you know, feel free to give us feedback on, on how useful it is and let us know what we can do better. So, uh, 15 of you, come with me, bring your chairs, come on. Three handouts, three pieces of paper. One is a two-sided document that says very loudly on one side, and saw our menu on the other. These are two actual letters of interest that the key uh, fellowships. We also have, what they, what made a proposal uncompetitive in 2015, so like a what not to do. Um, and then is my proposal ready for prime time? Uh, nine tips before submitting your letter. Uh, and I want to start with just kind of a general uh, why do we do this? Um, the first thing, the first thing
get across so much information and why people are hurt. You have to get across who you're working with, why they want to work with you, what are you guys doing, what are the nuts and bolts of it, what is, why does the solicit a desire, right? Um, what is the aesthetic what is the aesthetic environment? What does it look like? Why is it hard? Um, what is, why does it create social change? What is the context, right? Like it's actually a it's a ton of information, and what we found is that uh, proposals were like almost always really unbalanced. So you know, so so there are these really consistent patterns, right? That people would uh, make very very vague proposals in which because they didn't know what was going to happen, and they were being honest about the fact that they didn't know what was going to happen, and so you had no idea what was going to happen. There's no vision to hang on to. There were people who were so good at talking about the nuts and bolts of their proposal that you had no idea why it was not a project, right? They did, but it didn't come across the left, right? Or you have people who were so good at, at talking about the art part that you're like, there is no way that this is ever going to happen, right? And so, and so one of the things that we are thinking a lot about is the fact that in order for, like a lot of people are asking these these projects are often seen as proposals, not just by a blade grass, but by lots of organizations. So it's very important, you know, to kind of um, think through what makes a good proposal when you're trying to do something that has a social change goal and uh, and an aesthetic goal, and it's art, and it's happening in the community, and why should trust you and all of this stuff, right? So, what we're gonna do is, uh, these are two pieces, uh, is my proposal ready for prime time is like great general information about uh, uh, the balance, right? Most of, I'm not gonna read it to you, because it's, the clock is too small. Um, <laughs> but, um, but basically, these are nine questions that we, and we, there's the PDF version of this on our website, Right? And we encourage everyone to just ask these nine questions of themselves before hitting the send button. Right? And ask somebody else to read your proposal and ask it these nine questions. Because these are all about this balance thing. Right? Because as an artist myself, I can say that 95% of the time, uh, a third of what I write is, well, every single thing that I write, a third of it is still locked inside of my head. That's the nature of writing. That's not your fault. So, just, so that's just your information. Uh, what made a proposal uncompetitive in 2015? This is a little bit more about fit, right? Um, but it's also really good to check what you write against these things. Because these are like, these are literally groups that we like, people stats about, right? So just really quickly, uh, the organization structure too much like an organiza organization. We already talked about that. It didn't read as art, right? Make sure that whoever's reading your project for you and with you is like asks, is it really an art project? Does it look like an art project? Does it have formal or conceptual innovation in some way? We can talk more about it. It can happen in real life. It doesn't have to be a painting. It has to look like art. Representation versus enactment. This is something that we can talk more about when we have to get some questions about. Because this is tricky, right? But working with people doesn't automatically mean that we're engaged, right? Uh, so you want to ask questions about whether or not what you're doing is enacting a social change which will be engaged for a Prescriptive and overly uh, community engagement or straightforward education or outreach. Right? And so, so just have to ask questions about the tools we need to We love to answer questions about these because your time is very valuable. Uh, so let's get to the meat. Uh, Mary Mattingly and Saul Aramendi wrote two really fantastic letters of interest that are very different from one another. And they both, and one of the reasons that they're very different is because they are, they have completely different facts on the ground. So what I want to do is read both of these and compare how they each dealt with the unknowns differently and how they achieved balance, even 
though, uh, Mary has, like a lot of ways, they're both very speculative projects in very different ways. And so one of the things that I wanted to look at together is how they dealt with the speculative parts so that they came out with a balanced, clear result. Sound good? Okay, so let's take a moment to read these, and then we'll just turn and make like three or four. Yeah, and then we'll just talk about why these work so well. Sound good? Yeah. And I'll and I'll join all the groups. Any questions before we start? Last year we did this. Yeah. It worked really. It worked pretty good. Definitely we did a fun system. So uh, anybody who wants to be clear, completely random. The two other people who are also applying and one other adult to be there. Uh, just send them emails to the Say, how are you going to draw a name in a bucket? Exactly. Yeah, the 